just feel free to, to, to join this as a bit of more of a conversation than like a formal presentation. Um, my name is Gita Nandan. I am the co-chair of Resilient Red Book. Hildegard Mink back there is the other co-chair. Um, and I want to welcome everyone here to our sort of very first uh, Resilient Red Hook visioning action process stakeholder engagement. We will figure out a better name for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there are many others that have been invited. It seems like it's a hard weekend, so we're going to keep reaching out. Um, and we're hoping to really uh, create a very strong stakeholder engagement group that will work with us throughout this year-long process. Um, so just a bit of background. Um, uh, who are we? So some of you already know us. We've sort of been in touch with a lot of you in various <coughs> different capacities um, with different um, sort of agendas. Uh, Resilient Red Hook was started almost, crazy enough, six years ago now. Um, and it was uh, something that came out of Superstorm Sandy uh, through the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery and through the New York Rising process where the Governor's Office selected not, uh, 10 communities across the city to uh, receive and sort of do a self-determining process for disseminating what's called the CBDG funds. Um, funds that came through and were funneled down from the federal government after Superstorm Sandy. Um, so our community uh, committee went through a sort of year-long resiliency analysis, a SWOT analysis, and action-oriented analysis of process that determined various different projects that could receive those funds. That was the very start um, of where we are now. So six years later, um, we've become an official 501c3, and we, the committee, so there are 15 committee members, and maybe the committee members can raise their hands. Excellent, so we have some. We have many that are not here that are missing that will join us um, in the future. Um, so we have been sort of taking it upon ourselves to really understand what resiliency <coughs> means to Red Hook, how can we take further action? How can we strengthen our relationships with our city agencies to be able to make sure that Red Hook is viable within the next 100 years? Um, and so through, uh, through that process, um, we have met you know, thousands of various different Red Hookers. We have hosted many events. We're doing various different projects. Um, and you know, obviously, Red Hook is a low-lying, um, frontline community that was not only impacted by Superstorm Sandy, was impacted by Hurricane Irene, um, and likely will see further storms in the future, but it's not really just about storms. Water, we are a waterfront community, so water is super critical to our future and to our sort of way that we operate, but there are lots of other resiliency issues that we're trying to address, whether it be transportation, um, pollution, um, health issues, economic issues, social justice, social like sort of economic diversity, and just making sure that our neighborhood is a viable, healthy, beautiful, wonderful place that will remain here even as sea level sort of comes and as we um, deal with climate change further. So, you know, for us like climate change and this idea of resilience is a lens through which to look at a host of issues in our neighborhood. And so we use that lens to really sort of try and take action in various different um, issues. So we have been thinking about what our next step is. With through the New York Rising process, and I wish I had brought it with me, but I didn't, um, we did sort of publish a book that was you know, a result of the year-long process. That was not a comprehensive resiliency vision plan at all. It was really sort of a statement of the existing conditions. It is um, a list of actionable items, and it was a set of recommendations of projects that could be funded. But it lacked an, a, a sort of cohesive ability to integrate in various different agencies, the current projects that are underway, future projects, and the real desires of the neighborhood in terms of um, what actions we wanted to take. So, we decided, okay, we really should start this process. Um, we probably should have started it two years ago, right? Everybody, we always feel a little bit behind, and that's because climate change is becoming very real faster and faster and faster. So um, we have um, very luckily 
partnered with an organization called Perkins and Will. Um, David Green is here with Perkins and Will. Jessica, we have sort of a whole host of Perkins and Will folks in the room um, who are experts in leading community-based processes so that way we can create a sort of self-determined, action-oriented resiliency vision plan. That's the goal of sort of this year-long process. We can't do it by ourselves. We have no desire to do it by ourselves. To us, this is a community-based vision plan. And I don't, I actually want to take the word vision out and replace it with something else, partly because we want this to be actionable. The idea is that everybody that's in the room and hopefully the other 20, 30, 40, 50 people that we can get to be a part of the process will take action, right, and help us make what we want actually get implemented. Um, and it's sort of, without bringing too much politics into the room, <laughs> um, we kind of can't rely on the federal government anymore to sort of make sure that our you know, resiliency visions or actionable items are happening. We can kind of rely on the maybe state government and the federal and the state level and the city level is something that we feel like we can um, you know, sort of dig into. So we can't do this though without having a lot of voices and a lot of people taking um, action on that process. So um, we have taken sort of the big topics at hand um, and broken ourselves up into different subcommittees. So we have a subcommittee on energy and transportation, water, land use, um, economic diversity, and emergency preparedness. So those are our five big topics. Um, and hopefully everything fits into that, and maybe it's not so neatly packaged. Maybe we have to create another sort of committee. We'll, you know, we will explore those issues, that's fine. Um, but the idea is to be able to go through a year-long process and work through those various different topics and come up with not only actionable items that relate to a larger resiliency vision, but then an implementation process. Who do we work with? What existing projects exist out there? For instance, the integrated flood protection system that is a slight disaster, that is not a vision that the committee wanted, the neighborhood wanted, but how do we take that and leverage it to be something that we do want? Right? Or how do we leverage you know, Adam's great work around shore power and our conversations with EDC, how do we leverage that with much more action and implementation to be able to become an actual clean energy port system? Or, you know, so for instance, like we're working on a Red Hook community um, solar system. How do we take that and implement it into action? So ideally, not tomorrow, but hopefully within five years, we can feel like we've accomplished something that feels like our neighborhood is moving much closer towards resilience. Um, and so, like our team, our team is you in the room. Our team is Resilient Red Hook as being sort of the uh, drivers. And then our team is Perkins and Will, who is the strength behind us because we all have day jobs, <laughs> and they are amazing at this process. They're going to present some projects that they've done that relate to this. Um, and so the team is really all of us, and we're hoping that you as a stakeholder, as part of the stakeholder engagement group, will be highly active. And then we will be able to reach out to the larger community, which represents 11,000 people, I think, right? Some the numbers change, 8,000, 11,000, 12,000. Um, but we, as the steering, uh, you know, stakeholder engagement group, will then be able to reach out through various different media meetings, um, <coughs> trying to get as much input from everybody as possible to create this larger vision. Um, and so we will have various different ways for you to participate um, and if you want to become a super stakeholder engager, let you know, that's fine. If you want to sort of work with your group and bring on more people, you know, we will figure out what the right process is. We don't really have a specific, like, this is how we have to do it. We really want to work with you to try and define what the best way is to make this happen. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Perkins and Will, so that way they can describe um, some of the work that they've done. Thanks, Gita. Uh, do we need a couple more chairs?
Um, so as Tina said, my name is David Green, and I'm uh, the practice leader for urban design and planning for the firm Perkins and Will. Um, and it's interesting uh, that we're involved in this project, and it came about in sort of a strange way. And so I'm going to tell this sort of brief story because it um, gives everyone a little bit more insight of the way we're working with uh, uh, with resilience strategy in the Reddit community. And it, it turns out that Allison Reeves, who's sitting back there, who's on the committee, and I uh, were at school at the same time. 10 years, 25 years ago, 25 years ago, 10, and so, five years ago, um, and we've remained really close friends since then, um, and uh, we uh, caught up about a year ago, and, we were, and we've really gotten into resilience planning globally, um, and obviously things that are happening in Red Hook and, and the southern Brooklyn area um, are kind of uh, bellwethers for the rest of the world, and so, we started talking about this opportunity, um, uh, especially relative to a program that we have in the in the company, which is a we call a social responsibility initiative, and it's really our pro bono work. And so we we essentially have about 25 people working full time across the, the um, across the firm on pro bono efforts. And so this is actually the first time that we've taken um, seven offices across the firm, and they're all pitching in, and we're putting in place um, this resilience planning project for Red Hook. Um, and so we think it's going to be a fantastic effort. We've committed to a year. My guess is that if it's like every other project, we'll be working with you all for at least two, which is great. Um, and so we are, as Gita said, bringing a number of different people. Jessica works in Atlanta. She's done a lot of work with the Rockefeller Foundation. Amy's done a lot of work in resilience out of our DC office. Um, we actually hired Grace for the summer just to help support. And then we've got people from Austin, London, um, Toronto, and, and San Francisco. Um, in any event, I really want to just reinforce everybody that this is not our project. We get nothing out of this, right? Um, it never gets branded as a Perkins and Will project. It's really a Red Hook community project. And part of what we're going to talk about today is getting sort of clarity on what it is that you all want to see. Because one thing that happens in this process is we will get 500 things that everybody wants to do over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And we've got to work objectively understanding where the sort of um, community is coming from to figure out how we can leverage the assets, the collaboration with the federal, state, local government, and projects that are already proposed, but also access to funding that we might have through other venues, and see where we can actually get uh, implementable projects. And I think Gita hit it directly on the head that we are not, we're aspirational, absolutely but aspirations don't get things done. Aspirations don't keep the neighborhood from flooding. They don't increase the level of uh, economic diversity that we need to see in these neighborhoods. So, um, so with that, um, we just wanted to, we're, we're gonna be extraordinarily brief. Um, I just wanted Amy to touch briefly on what she's been doing with the, uh, especially the DC climate change and some other things. And then uh, Jessica to talk a little bit about the 100 Resilient Cities program. And then we're going to dive into the program. And the program is really about looking at what each of the committees have come up with and having an open discussion around each of these five areas and making sure that we've gotten um, the most important issues um, and, and we're starting to drive the discussion um, that's beginning today. So, Amy, you want to just quickly describe what this is about? Yeah, I'll go quickly. Um, so, uh, I was the, the project manager and one of the authors for the climate um, adaptation plan for DC. It's a resilience plan, but it started and it took so long that literally the conversation changed from climate adaptation to resilience while we were doing it. Um, so I think importantly, we came up with a lot of GIS data, a lot of statistics on vulnerable populations, how those vulnerable populations kind of lined up with hazards um, and different climate issues that were predicted to be happening, and sort of how do we focus on, on those vulnerable populations. We created an action item. One of the, the big deliverables was not just these reports, it was actual action items assigning different city agencies of either a you know, core responsible or you know, supporting agency. And we wrote these action items in a way that can be put into budgets because we didn't want it to be big flowery action items. It's literally a way for someone, you know, Department of Environment to pluck out an action item and make it a budget line item. So we didn't make this design focus or anything like that. It was to make an implementable, actionable plan that DC has already put a lot of these actions um, in. And we made the three time horizons, 2020, 2040, and 2080, so that you know more, more realistic and, and based on what conditions are changing. So 
How did you get them to adopt the line items? They, they just put it in the budget when they can. I mean, so the adoption of the action items is really as the budget comes and they put them in. But how did you get the relationship with the city? Oh, the city hired us. Oh, so we it. did. We did have a slight advantage okay. over you all yes. that the city hired us. Um, and it was interesting. It was grant funding based on the plastic bag tax. So this was some of the, so with their plastic bag tax, they've assigned <coughs> different projects. And this was one of them. So I think that that's also an interesting kind of thing to talk about as we talk to EDC and to people like that. How do you, you know, how do you fund some of these projects? And maybe it's something like bag tax or something. <coughs> And we, just to let you all know, we already have started talking with the city. We've got preliminary um, buy-in for partnering, even to the extent that the city is now um, scrubbed through all the planning projects, the projects that are in planning um, or pre-implementation, um, to identify large projects that we might be able to rethink so that we can get a higher value for the community. Um, and we have a sort of history of doing this, taking large infrastructure projects, sewer projects, figuring out how to turn them into both sewer and park projects, for instance, where instead of spending $40 million, we're spending $25 million and the community actually gets something other than a big pipe that's buried 60 feet underground. Um, and we have a, in our group, we have a bunch of, we also have engineers and transportation experts and um, sustainability experts, and so we'll bring those people to bear. But a big part of it to your question is, you know, getting involved with the, the government so that we can push out what we need to. Um, and we refer to a company called Area Research, which is our nonprofit research organization. And this is where we can support with efforts to bring funding in, whether it's grant funding or other government systems. But it, as Amy said, it's got to be set up so that it's really easy for the government to implement and, and, and uh, put directly into budgets, or it just gets lost. So. And, and I think it's where I was just talking. Um, I think the important part is, especially in the <coughs> climate right now. Yeah. Call it something different. If yes. resilience is right. a bugaboo word, think of a different word. Figure out what people are funding. What's the magic right. word that people like to fund? Call it that. Because right. in the end, we don't care what it's called as long as the project gets implemented. You know. Right. So. We can call a park a storm sewer as long as it's a park. Yeah. Everybody's happy, right? Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then this is just another one. If everyone's a little more familiar, Kingston, um, New York, upstate. Um, this was another uh, grant funding. This was the New York State. Um, Brownfield Opportunity Area. They had a lot of flooding going on in their waterfront, and coincidentally, they were also having a downturn in their economy and issues with having um, affordable housing. And so the idea was, how can we provide? I mean, it was a waterfront community that wasn't doing anything with their waterfront, and the water kept flooding on them. So it was sort of turning your back on the water, and then the water turning turning on you. And so the idea of how can we make it. We also work with SCAPE, who has done a lot of work uh, here in Bad Coast and around the harbor, and they um, helped us with a lot of this um, in this project. So. I just need to say that I felt that SCAPE was greenwashing a appalling project by Thor at you know, two of the Richards. Okay. You know, they said them it's really a shame of fun that their reputation was involved in. Um, and so, Jessica, do you want to just, yeah. so this is Jessica Flores from our Want She's going to run through the scope, and I promise that after we don't the scope, yeah. we're moving right into the... Um, I'll make this super quick, everyone. Um, again, hi, I'm Jessica. And this is a scope that we're developing with the team, so it's just, uh, we know that you know right now it looks very linear, but it's going to be a very fluid process. It just really helps to think like big picture where I'm going, and like David said, we're going to be more likely working for a year, but that's going to end up being probably two years, right. so that's absolutely fine. So right now, we're looking at four major phases. We're just calling them for lack of better words, discover, which is where we are right now, which is why so it's so important that you guys are here to help us understand all these key themes and key issues that we need to be thinking about and analyzing and going back to look at the work and all the amazing analysis that is already been done in the city and then just understanding and diving into that. So we're giving ourselves four months for that, but again, all of this is super fluid, so we're welcome your, your um, feedback on that. The second one we're calling a focus, and all we're doing is once we go through the discovery phase where we identify what we're calling research questions, which is just kind of like, where do we want to go from here? We go into that and we just go, you know, heads down and start analyzing and you know, working with the different steering committee, um, subcommittees to try to understand deeper what those are. And then from them, hopefully, we come up with a series of visions and goals. So like big thinking, big picture, where are we going with this? And then we get to prioritize. Like David was saying, you know, there's a thousand ideas that are going to come out of this and that have already come out. They're great. But it would be really good to start thinking, like, what are those action items that we actually want to put in the strategy and start thinking about them? 
And then later on, we just kind of document things. And by document, don't think of a report that is going to sit on a shelf. We're hoping that it, it can be interactive. It can be a data platform where you can just be, it can be a data wall. It could be user. It's going to be user friendly. Like all these things that are going to keep this, you know, alive and, and, and being updated all the time. So right now, we're just you know focusing on this for a year. But like I said, it's going to be fluid. Um, and a lot of the process, like David said, is um, some of the process that we've been following with uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, with the 100 Resident Cities program that I've been working on in Louisville, in Toronto, and now we're doing it in Minneapolis. Happy to talk about that also on the side. If you have questions. Just one quick question. Sure. So um, is it true that 100 Resilient Cities has pulled uh, its programming out of climate change yeah. and no. so there's a, a I'll just say this because we're doing a lot of work with them we're actually I was talking to dad about this we're going to be in Rotterdam for what everybody thinks is the last 100 RC pro uh, conference but there's can you not can you not use can you tell people what RC is people oh, don't know yeah, what that is well, the 100 RC is the 100 resilient cities program that the Rockefeller Foundation has been funding for about the last five years I guess yeah um, and ultimately, it was a way to get cities to buy into the idea of chief resiliency officers and programs organized around aspirational targets for um, uh, change in each of these cities. Um, and it's global, and it's been fairly successful. I think they're re-evaluating what they've been doing because they're trying to address more of the sort of science of climate change um, through this program. So I think with that restructuring, there was a, a lot of um, press about how they were uh, doing away with the 100 Resilient Cities program, uh, but it turns out that they're really working through a number of different strategies for um, uh, reconstituting it in, in different ways. And I actually think it's going to be a lot better. And I think that this this neighborhood will become part of that large change, and a kind of, we're hoping a model for whatever emerges through this uh, next few months. Because um, it's never bad to have uh, a slightly international spotlight on an area where you're working on um, because it, it forces the government to do things and sometimes they wouldn't normally do. Um, and I also just want to say that, it, that there, this is kind of a linear uh, process, but as Jessica referred, like we're totally open to moving projects forward more quickly. If we find an opportunity with a project coming forward and we can work with the government to implement something which is beneficial for the neighborhood, we're not going to wait until next April to involve ourselves. We'll do it immediately in a way that, that's beneficial for the community. And then the last piece, I just want to um, reiterate that the, everything that we produce is property of the of resilient red hook of the broader community. We don't carry any intellectual property or copyright on anything. And in fact, we have programs to help train um, and support the, the community. But all of this information will dovetail directly with what the city, um, the state, and the federal government use to determine funding streams and project execution. Um, and so again, it just needs to be as simple as possible to, to be adopted. Because if it's not, it's just really not going to happen. Um, and really quick, before we switch over, and if we want to do land use first, it's totally so yeah, okay. We're, the timing is we're so flexible. So my real job, all right, is to, every time somebody has a problem, it needs to be my problem. Right? So I'm like the sponge of all of the history of problems in the neighborhood. So you ask for it and we'll figure out a way to get it and we'll figure out a way to, way to make it all work. Because if we don't do that, we, we, we really, really, really want to move this through in a very positive way. And I, I will say that um, we have some amazingly cool way, ways of getting people involved and we've committed funds to make that happen and technical expertise to make that happen. So it's first and foremost. but, but my email and cell phone number is available to everybody and if you have a problem you let me know and our team will work through it to solve the problem this is one of the ways that we can help the community move forward in the next couple of years with that i'm going to turn it back over to you know, if you want to say anything before we start with the land use we're starting with land use okay. 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 so um so we have so we have these five topics um each committee captain is going to present what their community has sort of worked through over the past couple months in terms of existing conditions, ideas around how action-oriented projects might take place, existing projects that are happening, agencies and other sort of government officials or other officials that we might need to work with. Um, and we are going to present all five together and then get your feedback afterwards. If that feels like if you feel like you have lots of things to talk about, then I think we should just open it up for conversation as fluidly as possible. Maybe too much to sort of 
wait to the very end to talk about all five. Yeah, we also have um, the the big oh, post it. Okay. Uh, if people want to write, yeah, they want to write it, notes down. Yeah. I mean, this Either is the time where we're stuff. trying to get as much feedback as possible. So with that, I'll turn it over. To Thanks, everybody. Thanks also for coming out to here um, and for showing your commitment to, to Redbook. And I think uh, land use, I believe, is the biggest tool we have to change Redbook. But we have to start with a vision. And right now, Redbook is mixed income. It's mixed use. We're creative and compassionate. We want to be more compassionate. We want our land use patterns to support that ability to live and work in the same neighborhood and to be in a neighborhood that makes things and makes innovation to make even newer things. Land use, you might ask, like, what, is, what is land use even that it could do these social things? Well, land use is the rules that govern how we build and live on the dirt beneath our feet, right? It's actually fundamental to everything. And Red Hook has had this hiatus of no change in its land use for the last about 20 years. And when I was in the Bloomberg administration with that, the chair of urban planning wanted to keep it that way because she loved it. It was just perfect to her mind. So she wouldn't let any rezonings happen. But that time has passed. And the old land uses, the manufacturing zoning that kept everything in this kind of community that was able to kind of like, you know, like flowers growing through the cracks. Now that's under pressure, both from global capital that's pouring in right now to take the M zoning, the manufacturing zones, and turn it into last minute warehouses. You know, over millions of square feet have been bought for this purpose. That's something we never expected. Now we also have the problem of global warming and storm surge coming and, and hurting our, our land. As we talk about this, I'll throw out one interesting theory. I don't believe the federal government is going to save us. I don't believe the state government is going to save us. I don't believe the city government is going to save us. And I've worked at every level of government. I've worked inside government for a long time. The only thing that's going to save us is ourselves. And what we have, the only thing more valuable than our social cohesion and the bonds we have as a community is the land under our feet. So how we deal with the rules for how that land changes is going to determine how our community changes. I just want to put that, that out there. We can talk about a vision. This, you guys can read it, I won't go on, but the, the core of it is that we're innovative, we're compassionate, we're mixed, we want walk to work jobs, we want to learn continuously, we want to grow opportunity, we want to be safe from the storm. And that's hard to do when you've got to grow both in number and in jobs and in cohesion. So we'll be, as we go through this process over the coming months, we'll keep coming back to that. How do we change to keep what we have as our character? The biggest problem in anywhere in the world, keep what you love, but prepare yourself for the future. We love how great our character is now, but we need more housing and more integration and more jobs. These are some of our problems. I don't know how many of you live on Van Brunt Street, but you probably, if you do, you know that trucks shape your house 24-7. I am woken up so many times, I have a baby. It's not the baby that wakes me up. It's the empty container trucks bouncing on the sewer grate in front of my house and shaking the whole thing. I don't know what's gonna happen. It seems like there are too many trucks. Another problem that we have, historic buildings keep disappearing. Mysterious fires. The day before a holiday weekend, bulldozers come out. Fires start, we don't have that many of them left. You know, I mean, we're not rabid preservationists, but Buildings do have something to do with our character, so we've got to think about that. This is something that's kind of what I'm getting at when I'm not waiting for government to help us. How can land use support resilience? Right now, you look at the building code, everything is focused on how do you make your building protect itself. You know, that's not the question to ask. The question to ask is how can you make a building protect more than itself, protect the neighborhood behind it? What can buildings do together to do this? This is not an easy question. I mean, maybe maybe in Rotterdam and Holland they think about it, maybe in Singapore they think about it. We don't really think about it yet in the U.S., but we have the mines to do it here in Red Hook, we have the land to do it here in Red Hook, and we have the problem that we need to address here in Red Hook. So I think we have an ability to maybe do something new for America right here. So bottom line, we need a place for innovation. Okay. 
vision, big idea. Well, we have something called a 197A plan. I don't know, do you guys know what, what that is? It's, yes. a, it's actually an official document that about 20 years ago, actually Florence, you were part of this. Yeah. Karen, you were part of this. A group of neighbors, when Red Hook wasn't even really, you know, that well known outside of Red Hook, came together and created a plan for Red Hook. Pretty much what we're doing here, but with their own resources. And it's called 197A is a formal term, and it was approved by the city council. So it's actually part of the statute. It exists in law. So I'm saying as we do our visioning here, and as Perkinson Will helps us articulate what we want to do, let's not forget that 197A plan. Let's bring it back up, let's check, see what we've done that has achieved the goals from them, and see what's left to do and how can we update it. So I just want to put this front and center for 197A. Now, everything that we want in our vision has to be addressed. Afford the housing that we want can't just be marketed. It has to be affordable. And we can't also inadvertently get rid of housing that's affordable now by creating housing that's affordable later. We've got to preserve what we have and add to it in a way. Um, we have a lot of creative jobs here, but they're actually not that dense. How can we increase? How can we have more of them? How can we use the land in a way that creates more jobs per square foot, let's say? You know, that's, um, that's an issue with the last minute warehouses. Okay, it's, it's good to have some laptops. I mean, we're not saying there's anything wrong with the last minute warehouse, but they typically have one person in 3,000 square feet, bigger than this entire library, whereas most offices have one person and the size between these desks. That's the difference in the density in jobs. So I'm not saying we can't have last minute warehouses, but we last can't mile. use last mile warehouses. Last but minute, some totally. It's getting there. <laughs> 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 it's about, it is about last minute shopping. It's about last minute shopping. <laughs> so but look, all I'm saying is we want a mix of things, of course, but be careful with the last mile warehouses because they gobble up land, and there's only so yeah. much land to go. Um, the connectivity we have with the ferry, it's great. The bus is not so great. You know, we do need that so simple to get into lower Manhattan. That will come in, I'm sure, in the other committees talking. But the connectivity, what that does to land, transportation and land use are really one. Um, even though they have different departments, different deputy mayors look at them. No, they're really one thing. Okay. One thing that I'd like to stress, I'm working on something called a model block. I've been asking people for many years, they come into my house, we have a community planning meeting on Van Brunt Street, what do you love most about Red Hook and how can we put it into a single block that we can then repeat? So it's a model block concept that's mixed use, mixed income, just a Rubik's Cube of all the uses and things that, that we like and need here. I'm working on that, Karen's helping me on that, we're, we're actually going to try to make a real one of these. And if we can build it, do it, it's a model that can set the stage for the future. Okay, and that proper range of uses and mixes within blocks. This is, this is a new concept that Red Hook is pioneering. Typically, zoning and land use, this block is housing, this block is working. No, we, we can put these two together. We can mix uses in a way that, that other people have not been able to do because we have the social structure here to do that. And I think we have that desire to live and work in the same block. I live and work in the same block. I work in the same house. My commute is the best in the world. <laughs> so, anyway, we'll, let's, we'll, we'll go on, I'll stop here, but jobs, maintenance of character, and how we use all of our change to create more resilience. And resilience is social, and I think we're ahead of the game on social resilience, and we all commit to increasing that, but by meeting and building community. Every meeting builds more community, but we're way behind in physical resilience. So, Let's use our social resilience to create some physical resilience through the power of land use. I'll leave you guys with that. So don't sit, don't sit down. So, so the, the idea now is that this, as Gita said, is a sort of roll up of a lot of work that's already been done over the last six years. And so the big question is, um, you know, without getting into too much detail, does this make sense to everybody in general, or is there are there one or two other things that might need to be added to this this list of high priorities? Yep. Oh. I just want to, I'm going to post another way to think about it, besides zoning, um, I think another way to look at Red Hook is the huge influence of public sector on property ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that that's going to talk about, to then actually put some energy at those things because 
back in the huge influence over Redwood. Um, for those of you who know SMICHA, PARVS, yep. yep. um, EDC, Port right. Authority. The EDC is the entity that we at Portside um, suffer with the most, and we dealt with EDC and, and um, Port Authority. And I think that if there should be some education about that piece, because people are not really uh, 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 dealing with it directly. The, this is a really important. <coughs> slide, slide. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, I just, All right, say stakeholders, okay. Okay, Slide. yeah, good, because, because this is a different way to talk about this. It. Usually it's about zoning, 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 and then yeah. you think about where the influence is and what defines well, the neighborhood. It's not just the zoning, it's that public sector ownership that we can't get to move on anything. But let's right? look at the nexus between oh, ownership yeah, and, and zoning. Okay. So, well, no, 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 this is perfect, because I was just thinking about this this morning. When you have a, a monolithic ownership of something very large, mm. you have a monolithic idea. Right. When you have many people owning many parcels, you're going to get much Diverse, diverse ideas. So one thing is, how do we bring diversity into the thinking of these single entity owners? Or it's reform of something. I'm about to start with Bob Land a campaign to start reforming the EDC. So I, 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 I think it's... Go ahead, I'm with you. Yeah, no, so it, it, because that's the thing. It's not only ownership, it's, it's how they behave in the community. So there's all yep. this visioning or advocacy that's often done on single pieces, like Valentino, it's Parks Brownfield, it's sort of whatever, but the idea of the whole entity and how it doesn't respond well, to revenue is what I'm suggesting. Something, something that might be a correlate to that is that anytime we have a big development, what if the community, through like the WeFunder campaign that um, Sinjin from Fort Defiance and um, you know and from the, the Good Fort from Soe did, they created this WeFunder campaign, you could put in a dollar and you became a part owner right. of this enterprise. Is there a way that we want to consider that? Do we want to get more community investment into the things that are changing? Yes. Yeah, okay, so that's, but that, that ends up bringing diversity of point of view into it, which I, you've hit on, you, you Carolina always says all these important things. The other thing I just want to say is land use doesn't, I didn't see the specific little word water there, so yes. it's a maritime, neighborhood and it's got maritime potential and it's not just ferries for people. And so I just want to say, yep. you know, that water, these waters, it's not, water has great potential in Red Oak, largely untapped, it's not just a negative force. Exactly. And that's how resiliency has been framed. Excellent. One, one more thought on to, to boost as a, as a Carolina booster. One of the things that, that I've been thinking is, is you know, affordable housing does not have to be public housing. Individual landlords can commit. And, and there can be like a cohort of land, landlords that say, I own my property and this is what I commit to doing for the neighborhood. I'm, I'm a landlord, I do that. This is what I commit. I commit to this, this kind of affordability for, for, for my neighbors. And that's, whew, I get goosebumps that's, thinking about it. That's a good idea to make public, because there are a lot of old school landlords who want the stability of a friendly tenant, yes. so they're not charging market rate, but how yep. do you find that apartment's always the same.